Be Rooted Bead Co. is a small business working to create chic and classic jewelry meant to remind you of who you are, who you hope to be, and what inspires you. With bracelets and necklaces that transition effortlessly from the gym or school pickup to date nights and weddings, their hope is that their jewelry brings goodness and holiness into the ordinary and everyday. The heart of Be Rooted is custom bracelets that are meant to bring you back to what really matters. Maybe that's children or a spouse or a word that breathes life and purpose. My bracelet says a simple, send me. It's a prayer that keeps me focused on loving the people that God has put before me. You can find them on Instagram at berooted underscore beadco or their website, berootedbeadco.com. With the holidays approaching, Be Rooted is the perfect thoughtful gift. You can use the code SISTER for 15% off. Hello, I'm Allison Sullivan, and this is Center Saint Sister, a podcast that dives into whatever we might be feeling that day. I love introducing you to people that you might not know, but should. And I love connecting you with people you may already know and love, and then letting them share how they have lived life deeply. If you hear something over the next hour or so that you think a friend would enjoy, please consider sharing this episode. And if you haven't already, please consider writing a review. All of those things help us grow the podcast, which is really helpful. I hope you hear something that lets you know you are loved and helps you love one another. Welcome to Center Saint Sister. bodies. We all have one. And most of us, if not all of us, have a complicated relationship with it. As toddlers, we learn by moving and crawling, grabbing, sucking, constantly experimenting with our bodies what they can and cannot do. The basics of function, breathing, eating, sleeping, pooping, these things are so fundamental that their significance can be neglected in place of complexity. We live distracted. We're always attaining. We're always achieving. Our busyness becomes a badge of sorts, our to-do lists a trophy, until we finally get still and realize that maybe things aren't working as well as they should. Our sleep might be disturbed. Our appetite's wonky. Our bowel's unpredictable. Being touched can make us want to scream. And this is just what's fundamental. It's just plain old regular housekeeping. And yet somehow housekeeping is the hardest thing for many of us. It's like housekeeping is the hardest work we'll ever do, right? We would so much rather live distracted by harder or more complex things because maybe then at least there'd be a reasonable excuse for the struggle. Disconnected. We are so physically disconnected. Unfortunately, disconnection means that we have few ideas on how to communicate with our bodies. Maybe even that phrase sounds a little funny, but I am convinced that our healing, our wholeness, our fully embodied life, it depends on it. In disconnection, we live these fragmented lives where we busy ourselves with the outward pouring out, often neglecting a caring and loving, affirming, attentive relationship to the self. And it's harmful because we have really significant research in neuroscience that says our sense of self is anchored in vital connection with our bodies. We truly don't really even know our full selves unless we are fully in touch with our bodies. Question, does this describe any of you? Are you physically uncomfortable, but unsure exactly what the problem is? Do you have multiple vague, distressing physical complaints, but maybe a doctor can't put their finger exactly on it? Oftentimes, can you not figure out what you're really feeling or what would make you feel better or worse? Do you sometimes vacillate between feeling numb, which keeps you from anticipating or being responsive, to being so overloaded by your senses that you're a jittery, irritable, explosive mess, and you just might unleash on the next person who chews too loudly or bumps into you. Me too. But I think when we approach our bodies with curiosity rather than fear or dread or avoidance, hatred even, everything can shift. One problem is that I think we tend to see our bodies as machines. And when we see our body as machine only, we become trained to ignore our body's messages, sometimes waiting until they're screaming at us in pain or disease to make us pay any attention. When our body is machine only, it becomes a non-spiritual, non-sacred thing that that can become very easy to ignore. We so rarely appreciate our bodies for the wildly complex organisms that they are, divinely inspired, knit together, and called good. I also think there's a fair amount of fear 
being still, being attentive, carving out silence. Silence is a huge component of body work. It might reveal things we'd rather not see, we'd rather not feel. I mean, how many of us hate being alone? How many of us fall asleep at night to a TV? How many of us go to bed depleted by all the wrong things because we refuse to rest? So often this can be avoidance. We're afraid. We're afraid we might have to confront something in ourselves that might involve change or discipline or unknown or making a decision. We so often don't know how to just feel our feelings without being hijacked by them, at least. In this emotional avoidance, it has physical consequences. We might make a weak attempt to intellectualize our feelings because then at least we could be in control of them. But our chest caving in, our head exploding, being kicked in the gut, it's unbearable. So we'll do anything to make that go away. Clinging desperately to other people, numbing ourselves with food or drugs or alcohol, Desperate to feel something different, anything different, even if it's destructive, as long as we are in charge of it. Also, unfortunately, sadly, our bodies are something that we are so often repulsed by. And that might sound harsh or melodramatic, but I read a statistic that said that 86% of women said they are dissatisfied with their bodies. And you know that it's bad when your response to that is, that's all? Because I don't know that I know anyone who doesn't complain. Only 2% of women in the world would describe themselves as beautiful. That one broke my heart. We are bombarded by so many in images of thinness and perfection. We consume four to 500 images a day of what society says our bodies should look like. Singer and songwriter Jewel, she has this line in a poem that says something about looking through a magazine and being only able to concentrate on her dirty hand turning the page. We stand in front of mirrors, pinching and judging and feeling ashamed. We change our outfit six times. We check our butts in the mirror. Hot tears sting our eyes in dressing rooms. Our legs are too big. Our breasts are too small. Our bellies are too round. And we become so critical of our bodies. We dislike them so much that we begin to dislike the person who lives there. And we can be so mean about it. We would never treat our friends this way. There was an experiment where women were asked to guess the measurement of their waists and hips. They were off by 25% with their waists and 16% in their hips. We are so hard on ourselves and we aren't even accurate. And the truth is, is that we are biological masterpieces. Our bodies can menstruate and ovulate and create life and feed people. When we live disconnected from our bodies, we reduce it to only how it looks. Many of us have also experienced trauma, very real, physical, emotional trauma. And our bodies can shut down or freeze when we try to communicate with them. Living a fully embodied life can feel threatening. If we're stuck in survival mode, we're focused on fighting off unseen enemies, not nurturing or caring or loving or appreciating ourselves. And so we might know the reasons that our bodies aren't comfortable homes, but that knowledge, it doesn't make them any easier to live in. I'm not a doctor, and any advice given here should never be mistaken for anything professional. But I feel like if we would just give our body more genuine care, we might like it better. Breathing and silence and movement is a big one for me. It's such an important piece to, feel, to having a more friendly relationship with myself. We can't breathe in the future or in the past. Nothing roots us to the present moment like our breath. And in that moment, we can see that we are okay. There's no denying it. We're breathing. Silence is certainly more than the absence of noise. Silence is more about a posture of the heart. It's an asking and an answering. It's a searching and a finding. And it's making space to see what we're up against and how we feel about it. All of our emotions are welcome. They're invited to stay or go, but in that analysis, there's information there. Oh, I'm, I'm doing good with this thing. Oh, I'm, I'm not doing good with that thing. There's an intentional slowing down. And we know that Jesus slipped away. He obeyed deeper rhythms to get away when he needed to get away. And movement makes us feel good. It's just science. Almost any kind of movement will help. You know, there's this moment where movement quits being play and starts being exercised. When does that happen? I don't know. It's probably when we become aware that other people are watching. So then if we don't excel, we just quit. But once we start moving again, no matter what it is, 
we have these new epiphanies that our bodies are more than just how they look, but they are also valuable at what they can do. Positive affirmations are so valuable. Can we just be nice? Yes. There are parts of your body that you may hate, but I bet that there are parts of your body that you love. I bet that there is a part of your body that you love. Play it up. Is it your eyes? Is it your hair? Is it your hands? Pamper yourself. We can indulge in these small sensual pleasures like a scented bath or putting on lotion or getting a massage, wearing something soft and silky. Like I said, I'm not a doctor and I certainly don't have all the answers. I'm just a woman in a body and a complicated relationship. But we are creations that the Lord called good. And today, this day, I'm giving thanks for what my body allows me to do and how it allows me to serve and who it allows me to love. I know that there is a time that you felt good in your body. Can we bring that to mind and stay there a little more often? I know that there is someone that you deeply admire. Maybe it's someone who has loved you well, Maybe they've fought for you or taught you something or been generous. Whatever the case, whoever it is that you admire, can you bring them to mind too? The expression on their face, what are they saying to you? Here's the question though. How much does their appearance affect how you feel about them? Probably very little. My friend Marcia Lane McGee talks us through finding comfort in exactly who God made her. Her confidence is contagious, and it's possible she's going to have us all looking at ourselves a little differently in our underwear. She gives herself so much permission to be free, permission to be a body. Are you looking for adorable, durable, and unique baby clothes? Creator and owner Leslie started Chick Lane because she needed a baby dress and couldn't find anything she didn't think she could make herself, and they were just beginning their fostering journey and needed money for a bigger car. Now, Chick Lane is three generations of ladies designing, creating, and modeling unique clothes for the modern baby and toddler. Everything is completely U.S. made. Their clothing size ranges from zero to three months to seven and eight kids, and their products range from sweatshirts, dresses, joggers. Chick Lane is my first go-to for all baby gifts. Their website is chicklane.com, and you can follow them on Instagram at chick underscore lane. Yay. Thank you so much, Marcia, for being on the show. I'm so, so, so glad that you're here. One thing that we need to um, address quickly, like first and foremost, we have a mutual love and this is New Wave Feminists. (laughs) (laughs) And you are such an integral part of this spirited (laughs) pro-life activism. Like I'm just, I love Destiny's work so much and just creating a culture of life where abortion just isn't um, illegal, but unnecessary and unthinkable. Yes. And her approach and the way that y'all bring uh, more conversation and conversion to the conflict of abortion makes me so proud to say that I am pro-life. And you are right there, Marcia, right there at the helm of it all. In fact, just this weekend, you were in Juarez doing important work. Um, So you're doing that. But also, I have footage. You were turning just run-of-the-mill quiet dive bars. (laughs) into Selena singing (laughs) karaoke bars. (laughs) So before we get started with what we agreed to talk about, can you tell us a little bit about your weekend? Um, This weekend was amazing. I um, have never been so joyful and so heartbroken at one time. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that sounds like, like it was, um, I, we got to see, well, Destiny goes to Juarez quite a bit, like every couple months. And um, we have our board member, Krina, who has officially opened a branch of New Wave Feminist okay. in Juarez, Mexico. And okay, great. we kind of went um, down there to inaugurate, you know, mm. like this is a New Wave Feminist space. And we went to one of the shelters that we partner with um, in Juarez for migrant women and, and, and children and families. And it was really beautiful. Um, to be there, but I also, um, it really broke my heart. Like I didn't, so, um, so part of my story is that for a good chunk of my life, like, I I mean, any chunk that you spend is a good chunk, but, um, I had to live in a shelter with my family for a while. Um, and when I was in middle school and later when high school, and then, um, when I was in college home for the summer. So, Mm -hmm. There were at least four um, important points in my life where I lived in a shelter and Mm -hmm. it was, um, 
not every time did you see the goodness of humanity yeah. in the shelter. Yeah. And um, it really blessed me that I could be a part of something that treasures a person's humanity and yeah. is humane yeah. and um, provides that service. And so much of my time there, and I still haven't even processed this and it's okay yeah. that we're talking about it, but yeah. um, it was reminiscent of the time that I spent wow. with my mother and my sisters um, living in a shelter. Wow. And what that meant for our family. Yeah. I'll be praying with you for that to be redemptive and, you know, in a way as you process and put and I that didn't experience expect it to into be. words. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> like I didn't expect it to be. And it was just, there were points where I was like, yeah, I remember this. I remember mm. what this felt like. I remember mm. what this was. And it was, uh, and it, not that I had forgotten that I, that we'd been homeless for certain points in our, in our life and my childhood, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but, um, it's not something that I always think about. And I never realized not especially realized how much it shapes my work and in what I do, um, mm -hmm. and understanding what it is, understanding what it is not to have, um, right. and to rely on others. Um, cause that's self-reliance is such an American value and, mm -hmm. but it is, I think it's such a, like it is a crappy value. Like it shouldn't be a value, right? right. I think it's a vice. I think self-reliance is a vice and, um, we put so much virtue and value in self-reliance. And, um, and I think that sometimes hinders us from helping those who cannot help themselves. Yeah. Um, and it just reminded me that we are, um, like the poor are always with us and mm -hmm. we need to serve them and we have to give the poor what is theirs, um, their share of what we have. And, um, it really, reminded me of that this weekend. Yeah. And it gave me joy because I got to see like how far I've come, mm -hmm. but also the reality that there are a lot of people here who are just one missed paycheck away from also having the same circumstances Absolutely. because a lot of the times that's what it was in our family. We were trying yeah. to keep our head above water yep. and then one missed paycheck and then right. we we're packing up everything and moving to a shelter. Thank you for sharing your fresh experience with us. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> yes. Um, we also really love uh, Brick House in the City together. And that is actually oh. <laughs> how I became aware of your prophetic voice. And as I started oh. to follow along, I realized that there are so many things um, that we could talk about, but we settled on body positivity. Um, so I was thinking about just diving in with a simple question of, do you remember a time where you were first aware of your body? Um, yeah, that probably, gosh, it probably was when I was in second or third grade, um, where I, and here's the thing, and it's so crazy because I thought I'd been a big kid all my life, but when I look at pictures, I goes, mm. no, it was like everyone, yeah. like I wasn't a big, like a big quote unquote, big kid uh -huh. until like <laughs> much later. <laughs> Cause I was like, man, I wish I was as big as it was when I first said that I was fat. <laughs> I know. Isn't so it always that way that. to look back at pictures? Like, what was I complaining about? <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Yes. Um, but it's probably when I was in second or third grade and it wasn't anything negative, but I remember, mm. um, I was very close. I'm still very close to my uncles. Um, they, I got, my dad wasn't really super present in my life. My uncles were my father figures and they were the ones who made me like rough and tumble. Mm. And I remember one time, like I jumped on my uncle's back and he caught me and he's like, I cannot do this for much longer. And uh -huh. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. we're going this way. And he's yeah. like, getting too big. And that, and it wasn't supposed to be a negative comment, right. but that kind of stuck with me. Like, I remember that experience where it was like, I'm getting too big. Yeah. And then watching the women in my life um, worry about their weight and their body yes. image, um, that absolutely contributed to what I looked at when I saw the mirror, I was like, am I too big? And I, I am built like my dad, like I am built like Elaine, um, which means that you're built like a freight train. Cause that was legit. His nickname in high school was freight train. And I'm freight train junior and I am built like Elaine and it doesn't matter how small I am. I am going to be substantial. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, right. 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 So when my body, as my body grew, um, and then it wasn't again until I was probably in middle school, in those preteen years when we couldn't find clothes to fit me mm -hmm. because clothes were built a certain way for mm -hmm. girls my age. And mm -hmm. then it was like, these pants cannot fit around your thighs and your butt. And what are we going to do? Yeah. <laughs> Cause I, I was built like, it was like a whole lame thing. Like my poor niece, not my poor niece, because she's beautiful and she's not poor. Um, my beautiful 
told me who is eight. She is built like Elaine as well. And I was like, it's okay. It's you and me, girl. We got that. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so it's interesting. My, my first, and this was negative for me. It's like, you know, you can kind of just take in the facts around you and it doesn't have to Mm -hmm. have, you know, I don't know. It's just information. It doesn't have to be good or bad, but this was a very negative experience, but it was the first time that I remember being aware of um, what I looked like. So I was young. I was playing on a playground. Um, A mom had showed up early onto the playground to take her daughter early from school. And as she was getting her daughter for them to leave, she took me um, by the elbow and she pulled me aside and she hissed into my ear um, the words, you would be nothing without your hair. And I, right? I mean, I was stunned. And like this was if so I were wearing far... earrings, I'd be taking them out right now because those are fighting words. Right. Like that. <laughs> what? Not real. And it was so far outside of like um respectable adulting that it was like, you don't hate uh, this woman hated me. You know, there was this like or respectable flick... peopling. People, people, <laughs> just peopling. But like there was this flicker of heat in her tone, you know, like she hated me. And it was like Adults aren't supposed to hate children. And even if they do, they're sure not supposed to tell them about it. And the whole thing just made me feel so shameful. I remember standing there frozen, my feet frozen to the ground, owl eyed, like looking around going, what is everyone else doing so right? And what am I doing so wrong? And then it was, and what did she say again? That I would be nothing without what? My hair? What does that mean? Is she saying that I wouldn't be pretty? Is she saying that's everything? Is it? Like, it was just this total, like, taking stock of how am I being perceived? And I was, I was aware of that I was being perceived for the very first time. And like you're talking about, you know, witnessing the women around you, these young um, experiences can condition us to how we feel about ourselves present day, Mm -hmm. you know, like those things work their way into adulthood. I'm like, I see something like, who is this woman and where is she? No, because here's the thing. (laughs) I wasn't mature enough. She hated herself. Exactly. That's what it was. At the end of the day, she did not hate you. She hated herself and she was mad that you were still beautiful despite what she thinks that other people should have thought of you. And, she, and I wasn't mature enough down. to see her brokenness, right. you know, and it was, and in fact, I but was mature enough to see her brokenness when I was in my late twenties and I was sitting in a stylist chair and I was going to experiment with a short haircut. I had suppressed this memory. I did not remember this, but I'm sitting there getting my haircut. I was getting it cut really short and I had this um, overwhelm of, oh, oh gosh, now I won't be pretty. And I, it came flooding back to me. And there were these like hot tears stinging my eyes. And so then I was mature enough to be like, wow, that was a really sick woman. I mean, what in the world? Who does that? <laughs> right. I know. I, yeah, no. So now here we are, and there are these impossible beauty standards, right? I mean, especially now that we're able to Photoshop ourselves into perfection, right? And like, there's all these filters, and it's like the face God gave us is really kind of just a suggestion now. Um, But it's, you know, every... (laughs) um, Every media platform upholds it. You know, it's like perfect teeth, perfect skin, perfect hair, size two. Um, And so... Trying to feel beautiful can feel quite futile. Um, what are you trying to be, Marcia? Or how are you resisting these messages? Or are you? Here's the thing. I feel a lot of the times I am resisting them, but I also think maybe I'm not. Mm-hmm. Um, because I'm really just trying to be Marcia, like all yeah. day long. That's what yeah. I want to be. Yeah. And I think resisting them has been such it has to come with intention. Yeah. Right. Um, how you present yourself to the world is incredibly intentional, right? How the world perceives you, that is not on you. Right. Like that's not, that has nothing to do with you. Right. But how you present yourself to the world from like is intentional, whether that is whether or not you choose to dress up, whether or not you choose to wear makeup, you know, do your hair, do all these things. I am a very much, I, me personally, like as Marcia, I am high maintenance in taking care of myself for like, like internally, 
Mm. Right. I like certain things. I like, you know what I mean? Like I have this saying that says like, I am high maintenance. I don't expect anyone to maintain me. So it shouldn't matter to you. Right. Yes, like it right. shouldn't matter. Right. <laughs> so it's like, I am high maintenance. Absolutely. I am, but I maintain myself. Yeah. And with like beauty things and like living up to the standards, I, I think I've organized myself in a way. Um, cause I was thinking about this over the last couple of days, I ordered myself in a way that I can follow them with a, like minimal work because the minute I have to like decide, oh man, okay, I should do this to look this way. Like I wear my hair natural because my gosh, trying to straighten it every day yeah. when I was younger was like, this is an impossible standard and mm. I legit have class. So yeah. I start wearing my hair natural. And yeah. Like my hair looks to be. So natural. Yeah. And this is great. Like, hmm, imagine how revolutionary that is to wear your hair the way it grows out of your head. And that kind of started <sighs> yeah. rejecting that standard, right? Um, Because a lot of my beauty standards have been, or rejecting them or accepting them has been done out of convenience. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's like, what will, right? And a lot of- um, Out of self-care. Uh, like, this is how I'm going well, to maintain just, my really, sanity. Yes. So it's like, Hmm, I want to make sure my hair looks good every day. So I'm going to make sure it's moisturized. I'm going to wear my bonnet at night. I'm yeah. going to make sure I drink yeah. water and wash my face. And that helps my skin and yes. whatever it turns out to be, that's what it turns out to be. And I'm not trying to say I'm such a flawless b- b- beauty, whatever. I drew in some eyebrows cause they were a little sparse <laughs> earlier today, or I put makeup on, but I like makeup. Yes. Right? I love, me too. Yes. Right? And I don't do anything to maintain a beauty standard unless I find enjoyment out of it. Praise. And that is kind oh, of where I, I draw the line. So much. So like I do things, right? Like I like, you know, like r- right now I'm like, I love putting highlighter on. It gives me a glow, right? Yes. I have a light with this zoom camera right now. Uh-huh. Like, but those are, but it's not anything that has inconvenienced my life. Like the minute yes. it starts to inconvenience my life and my mental health, then I'm out. Right. And I think that's kind of where I have to draw the line with it right. every time. And we can all have an, this individual approach. I love that it's about, this is about me. It's how you started out your answer. This is about me. It's not for anyone else. And by the way, what imprisons you might empower me and what empowers me might imprison you. And so let's just answer this great call exactly. to help me get about my business and be a servant in this exactly. world. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. And, yeah. and it's those things that I have to do. I think a lot of um, cause a lot of people say, they go, oh my gosh, you just look so flawless and you're so beautiful and you're so this. And I was like, thank you. First of all, thank you. Second of all, like, this is a new thing within the last decade, <laughs> right? Yeah. Within the, like I had, like, I want to say within the last decade, like that was the first time I actually felt pretty without mm. feeling the need to lose weight. Right. Wow, or change yeah. something or do something or put in all these extra effort. Yeah. Right. Um, do you so know what the switch new, was? This come with life. Um, well, okay. So it's funny. The switch I think came in 20 in 2013. I had like, I was having a rough time with life and I gained a lot of weight, um, like stress weight. Like I like, it was like the first mm-hmm. time in my life. I actually can say I gained stress weight mm-hmm. and because I don't know, like I wasn't doing anything different. Um, and mm-hmm. I was having a hard time and I was going on a trip with my friend, Katie, and Katie had been losing weight. And Katie's like, I feel good. And like, Katie had been losing weight and Katie was starting to be my size. Right. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, I feel really great. Um, I'm going to wear a bikini for our trip because we were going on a cruise. We were going to like all these places. And she's like, I'm going to wear a bikini. And I was like, and I used to always have this thought that I would look really good in a bikini, right? Because, and I did, I was like, was like, I was like, I look great in my underwear. I think yes. I could totally wear a bikini, right? Listen, guys, I look real good in my underwear. Not that you're ever going to get to see it, but <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like, I just, I do like, I have yeah. great legs and like, uh-huh. I, cause you know what I mean? I like, here's the thing. The lane body has worked out for me. I love way. it. I love it so, so much. I they, actually they're, have they're chills. Big, but they're beautiful. I like, have chills hearing a woman say, I love the way I look in my underwear. It makes me so happy. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, I, I do. And I was like, I could probably pull this off. Right. I was like, I could do like a high waisted something, whatever. Uh-huh, and she's uh-huh. like, well, I'm going to do. It. And I was like, okay. And I just gained like 30 pounds. Right. And I was like, right. I didn't feel great. I was like, whatever. And I go, well, Kay's going to wear a bikini and I think I'm going to wear a bikini. And so I bought my first bikini 
online. Like it was a whole thing and I tried it on and I wore it and I was like, this is cute. This is really cute. (laughs) Right. And I felt really cute and I didn't know how, and it was like me getting to wear my underwear outside. Yeah. Would it not be in my underwear? Yeah. <laughs> because that's weird if I walk outside in my underwear. I'm just saying uh-huh. Uh-huh. that's not allowed anywhere. And so I was like, okay. And this is me, like in a size 16. It is okay. Something weird about me, no matter how much weight I gain or lose, like I'm usually a size 16. It's just how good the size 16 is. <laughs> you just hang out there. <laughs> like I just hang out at size 16. There was a time in my life that yeah. I did have a pair of t- size 10 jeans. And I was like, oh my God, but I also wasn't happy. So yeah, there we yeah. go. But I was miserable. <laughs> kinda, like that is home base for me. I'm like, yeah. it's good. I can find my size and like jump, put these jeans on. But um, <laughs> and, and that's what it was. It was, I was at what I felt was probably my ugliest and my biggest. Hmm. And I bought a bikini and I put it yeah. on. Yeah. And it wasn't even a, it was kind of like, I look good. Like I looked at myself objectively. It was like, yes, yes I have stretch marks because I've had a kid and I have yeah. all these other things. I have this, but man, this is a cute bikini. And that's what changed it for me. I think I that's love what changed it. it was in 20, it was 2013. You just no, gave 20, yourself permission to wear yeah, your underwear out in public. Yeah. <laughs> <my underwear. laughs> and now like bikinis are my preferred swimwear. I oh my gosh. I, you they, do. And here's the thing, here's the thing about bikinis. Ugh. They're a lot more convenient than one pieces. And Agreed. that is the thing. And that's the thing about it is like, this is so much more convenient. And let's be real. Tankinis make you look like your mom's mom. And, yeah. um, <laughs> yeah. so like they really do. Yeah. And I look cute and I don't have to, um, wrestle with a wet swimsuit. If I have to go to the bathroom or do whatever yes. or change it is. And that's what I'm saying. Like it's out of convenience. Like this yeah. is convenient and I feel good and I look good. I and love it so that kind of started it. Like, and yeah. now I'm just like, here I am in 2021. And I'm like, I own like, I still, here's the thing. I will never get rid of that first bikini. Yeah. Like I will never, ever, ever get rid of it. And sometimes I still wear it. Uh-huh. And sometimes I'm like, I have better bikinis. I really don't want this one to fall apart. Like my first bikini like yeah. has a special place and I will never declutter it. It means something. I love it. Yeah. I feel like yeah. so much of making peace with ourselves is handling what could be rejection from the outside world without actually rejecting ourselves, you know, kind of making yeah. this great realization that I can be my own observer. Um, through a better lens, you know, and, and kind of realizing that I'm not the one who's broken here. The world is, and that doesn't have yeah. anything to do with me. I just, I feel yes. like you have set such a clear boundary in that regard. And I have, and I don't, I don't allow people to call me brave for embracing my body. Cause I think mm. that's gross. Um, mm-hmm. because it's like, how am I like for presenting myself the way that I am? That shouldn't be brave. That doesn't say anything about my bravery. Um, it says a lot about society's brokenness uh, and yes, well like, said. just me. I'm like, yes, I'm like, I'm not brave for wearing this bikini. Yeah. I paid for it and I put it on my body. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's not, but you know what other, what you know. people who say that, you know what they're contending with? They're contending with this inner critic, right? Because they're thinking about a mean voice in their head. And they're saying that's so brave of you that you're not listening to this inner critic that, that shames our own selves before anyone else has a chance to. And, and, that mean voice that makes us take steps back when we're so desperately trying to, to move forward. Um, so how, how do we become our own cheerleaders? How do we see our own goodness? How do you manage, um, an inner critic or do you even have one? How do you see yourself through a lens oh, of kindness? I have How an about inner that? Critic. I am a type A. Of course I have an inner critic. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's just not always about my body. Sure, um, sure, sure. That's the thing where it's like, um, but that, here's the thing that took a long time. Yeah. Um, gosh. And I, w- I love to say like a, sw- a switch flipped. I think it was a lot to do with the fact that Katie was like, I'm going to do this. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to do this with you. I love and Katie. I write and it, it, <laughs> I, write, I love Katie. <laughs> like she's one of my favorite people in the world. And like, we're still like, we're still friends and everything. Uh-huh. And I, um, I think it took her saying, I'm going to do this and me because of her confidence. And I don't even, gosh, and I hate that too. When people are like, you're so, I, how do you get your confidence? And I was like, mm-hmm. how do you get your confidence? Please don't tell me I'm confident, you know, but like, um, her, I think it was her conviction actually. And being like, I'm going to do this. I think I can do this. And then I was like, I think I can do this. And I think that I, 
her giving her giving herself permission allowed me to give myself permission. So I really like to, I like to try and be that person that reminds other people, you can give yourself permission to do this and to not worry about it. And, you know, wear whatever you want and don't listen to anyone. Like, mm -hmm. cause I don't think that, I don't think clothes and the way you wear them has a moral good or bad because it really, like I said, it's how you present yourself to the world, how people interpret it. That's a whole different story. Yeah. Right. And like, all the way, no matter what you wear, what you dress, if you want to wear your underwear out in public, you might get arrested, but <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> you know, so much of what you're saying. So I think the newest term that people are embracing right now isn't necessarily body positivity, but they're talking about body neutrality. And I feel mm -hmm. like so much of what you're saying, you know, kind of lends itself more to that angle where it's like, it's not, it's not good or bad. It just is like my body yeah. is this well working machine that is, that is functional and does a million amazing things a day. And, and embracing this isn't about being, you know, morally good or bad. It's this neutrality of, I appreciate my healthy body and, and what it can yeah. do for me. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's the thing. It just is right. Like, with the inner critic, like, cause you were talking about, you know, we all have an inner critic and really it's just about maybe <laughs> turning that volume down real low. It's not that it's not there, but I feel like there's power in acknowledging it and then saying, okay, you can go now. And so yeah. maybe turning the volume down to a one or a two and then rising up that wise woman volume mm -hmm. or, or Katie, you know, like kind of right. elevating a different voice and lowering the one that says mine, mine always says, who do you think you are? You know, if I have a, a new idea or if I want to, you know, try something different or it's always who, who on whose authority, who it's like the Lord's authority. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, he said I could. So you go talk to him. Yeah. Like there is a, um, like black folks say, argue your mama, not me. <laughs> so you go argue your mama, don't argue me. Or try Jesus, not me. That's another yes. one. Yes. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yes. That's so great. Well, so physical, just as I age, you know, physical beauty has certainly become um, less important, you know, just mm -hmm. as, a, as a part of maturity. But I cannot seem to undo. Um, it's like this linking of what other people think about me to what I think about myself. And so um, I'm sure I know that that's not um, uncommon, but breaking that habit, that bad habit, um, it feels a little booby trapped because we're supposed to look outside of ourselves to determine our worth. Yes. We're supposed to look to a good father to tell us who we are. Yes. Um, and we just end up looking in, in all the wrong places. Um, yeah. And here's the thing about that. It's that if I could do anything based on what I felt about myself, these conversations wouldn't be necessary, right? We still have to go on job interviews. Yeah. Right. Hopefully people like us so that we can feed ourselves and our families. Right. We have to hope that people like the content that we're putting out, right? Absolutely. You and I both have podcasts. I hope people like my podcast yeah. and they listen to it and they want to hear my voice yeah. and pay me to come to events, right? Like for all the, to provide our human needs, people actually have to like us in some capacity. Yeah. And that's such a really small part hard. of who we are. Yeah. Yeah. And, we, and that's the thing where it's like, yes, if I could like myself enough to feed myself, then great. Mm. But that's not the reality because we're rewarded by having the good humor of others. Right. Yeah. Or being, you know, and, and that's kind of where that is. And so, yeah, that is difficult. Um, we have to make sure that we don't care what people think and the things that are important, right. Mm -hmm. And how well we love ourselves and like ourselves, right. Yes. I have to be objective about, okay, I need this person to like my work, right. I need to produce a product that someone else would like and want to buy or invest in. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. But then I also have to make sure that there are enough things that I know that I like for myself, yes. or I don't lose part of myself doing that. Right it's right. part of my integrity doing them. Right. So I'm going to do a job. Like I work in child development and I hope I'm doing a good enough job where my bosses are like, yes, you can keep doing this job so mm -hmm. you can feed yourself and go on trips and buy all the Taylor Swift merchandise. <laughs> and I say, thank you so much. Right. And that's fine. My fearless um, vinyl just came in and I'm like, oh. been listening to it. I got back oh. to Mora's, but, so um, good. So good. <laughs> but like, do you know what I mean? So it's like, I hope they like me enough, but I hope that the 
my seeking their approval doesn't lessen my approval of myself. Right. And I think that's kind of where we have to right. get that balance from. Like, will I, am I proud of me? Yeah. Yes. Speaking of Taylor Swift and since you brought her up. So she, in her documentary was like, okay, so I get skinny enough. Like you've told me to, and then I don't have the booty that you like. And so then I gain weight to get the booty that you like. And then I'm shamed for, you know, not being a size two. So it's, you know, it's utterly impossible. I know we moved on from that topic, but T Swift, love you. Um, I listen. I love her all the time, but I also think that (laughs) I'm going to say this really quick. There are certain people who have the privilege to be who they are as they are Mm -hmm. now. And she's one of those people. Mm -hmm. Yes, she'll have her critics, but her critics don't matter because that woman is worth $500 million. Yeah. Right. Like she can still build a life that she wants Uh and drown out her critics. There are people like us who can't drown out our critics, right? Like there are people like she's already put out the product that people want to buy. Yeah. And people still want to buy. She's re-recording all of her music. And we're like, yeah, yeah <laughs> give us more. We will buy it all. Right. <laughs> and she's doing the thing. And so she actually has the privilege to be like, I can gain 50 pounds if I want. If I still like me, that doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. But other artists still don't have that yeah. privilege because yeah. we're still such a broken society. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so yeah, she can do yeah. all that, but it actually, it matters maybe for her and if she chooses to listen to critics, but it actually doesn't matter. Yeah. So like I know that I, sounds no, I, no, I think it's an, an interesting point. I am a yoga instructor and, um, the time that I'm on my mat, it's just this, this holy invitation for everything to come into play at the same time, mind, body, spirit. It's just, mm-hmm. it's a reclaiming of my body. It's a settling of my mind. It's a, a wonderful opportunity to just feel my feelings and kind of take stock all around everything in harmony. Okay. What, what am I, what am I, um, up above. Okay. What am I underneath? You know, it's just this, this opportunity to kind of create calmness Mm -hmm. and stillness in a world where we live at a hectic pace and with a chaotic schedule, all of the above. But (laughs) when everything's in harmony, (laughs) when everything's in harmony, um, there's this really connected feeling. And I feel like we have a tendency to live so disconnected. Um, you know, we so, um, readily are are quick to compartmentalize, well, that's just eating or that's um, just, you know, reading the Bible or whatever. You know, we have these very clear delineated lines. And um, I end every single yoga session with um, just an invitation to give thanks for your healthy body and what it just allowed you to do and how it allows you to serve and who it allows you to love. And in that moment of connectivity, um, where it's not just about exercise, you know, it's, it's everything all at the same time. Um, I don't know that there's much greater peace than that. You know, it's just this, this moment of, of tranquility, um, maybe for the first time all week, you know? And so I think that there's something to the connectivity. Um, why do we live so disconnected? What's going on? Do you have any thoughts around disconnectivity? Um, I think it's because we are in the comparison trap. Mm -hmm. And like, I think that's why we're disconnected. We're disconnected from our body's like actual goodness and our bodies, the goodness of our body's use. Mm -hmm. Um, and our body's beauty because we compare ourselves to what uh, someone, what someone else has that we don't. And I think that's the part where uh, here's the thing. Comparison is the thief of joy. Yeah. And it's not even like the thief that comes in the night. Like it is a broad Hmm. daylight thief. And it, and it takes us down and takes us out. And we put so much energy into comparing ourselves and that comes with and that's with anything right like do they have the great do I have good clothes like them do do I have this do I have this and um their friends are different than mine and they have more followers than I do and they do you know what I mean like we are taking ourselves out of ourselves all the time or even their assignment is bigger you know like they have more important work than I do yeah you know I I, and which I think comes from a good place. We all crave a life that matters. You know, I mean, I I think that it's a, it's a holy desire to want an important task or whatever, but it can get to an unholy place when we start. Yes. 
but here's the thing though we are already we're all of us are already living lives that matter right like all of us play a role in the bigger picture yeah it might not be like i used to do theater as a kid and then as an adult in community theater there are no small parts just small actors right and that is a real thing yeah um like the production wouldn't be able to go anywhere if there weren't chorus members and I say this as a former, like, <laughs> perpetual chorus member. <laughs> like, um, it wouldn't go anywhere, yeah. right? Like, our voices, we need our voices to prop up the leads' voices. Yeah. We need to add that music and that background noise. And so you're right. Everyone does re- um, desire to live a life that matters. The kicker is that we already do. I love it. We just don't think it matters enough. That's right. And Try I getting through your day without problem. an elbow. I mean... Right. You know? Exactly. Right. <laughs> it, that's what it is. It's like, here's the thing. I absolutely recognize that the person who is passing me my unsweetened iced tea at McDonald's matters because guess what? I need my unsweetened iced tea <laughs> at that point of the day. Right. Thank you for making it. Thank you for mm-hmm. pouring it. Thank you for serving it. Yeah. Right. It doesn't, you don't matter. Like you personally don't matter any less than the CEO of McDonald's because the CEO of McDonald's can't do your job. Yes. The CEO of McDonald's can't do all the jobs. And isn't looking right? me in the eye right now, making my day better. And like, right. Exactly. Me. Yeah. I'm like, I say, thank you to you. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, we're all like, we're all want the same thing as we want to yeah. all provide for ourselves and our families and, you know, everyone else that we love and that matters. Right. Yeah. Like I, and that's the thing that we have to recognize. Like, are like there are differences in our missions and there are differences in like what we have to do or even what we're called to do but everybody who wants to live a life that matters guess what you already are yeah. and that's why when we compare ourselves like their body's not this body and that body's not this body and it's like I can't compare like I can't compare myself to your body there's no way I will ever get your body yeah. I'd have to have a lot less melanin yep. I would have to take all this kink out of my hair yep. right like but also your body can't do what my body did that's right right like and I tell people all the time I go I'm a site I'm like I run marathons like I did that in this body yeah it doesn't look cute but it got me 26.2 <laughs> miles several times and I will never do it again, but it did it. Like for like a, a season of my life, that's what I did. And that's what this body did. Yes. This body brought forth a life, oh, right? Like this, amen. like I can't compare myself. Like I can just remind myself of what I have. And I think that is where we lose. That's where that disconnect comes from. Like we are not grateful for what we have. We're just yeah. mad about what we don't. Yeah. And I, I feel like I'm, so I need to step much. off yeah. the soapbox. Though, no, me. it's <laughs> so good. And I know that there's, are. you know, there's so many topics tied to this topic. You know, I mean, we could go down a million different angles, but just unattain, unattainable standards. There's race, there's trauma, um, there's self-loathing, there's our mental health, there's our actual mm-hmm. physical health. So many people are living in chronic pain. I mean, this is, this is a, a thick topic, but I, I want to keep learning from beauties like you, Marcia, who have just, you know, I feel like it's a rebellious act almost even, um, to love our bodies and to be excited about a bikini and to go, you know what, I'm doing it. And yeah. it, you know what? It's really only awkward for the first couple of minutes. After that, it's yeah. totally liberating. <laughs> um, because why are you at the beach watching me? You should be looking at the ocean right. and the waves and all that's these things. Right. It's like, did you come here to watch me? That's real weird. Don't make me start charging admission. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I think that it's such a, a healthy even if it's lofty, it's healthy and good to the opinions that I have about my body. They come from me and they come from my God. And I'm delightfully normal. You know, like there's, there's just, I am delightfully normal. I am, I am, am, have full permission to just be a body. Um, Anyways, so I I think that there's a lot of heroism that you bring up to the female body and what we are capable of doing. And I just thank you so much for pointing to us or pointing us to that today. I'm really, really grateful to have you on. I feel like I could talk to you forever. (laughs) You know, right? (laughs) Well, I hope you come back because this was this was a lot of fun. And and like I said, I can tell we could go on for a while. But thank you so much. Will you tell people what you're up to, how to find you? Um, yeah. Well, what's going on? How, yeah. how do we follow along? Yeah. You can follow me on Instagram at stylishly see us stylishly like the adverb, um, and see ya, like uh, my nickname as a kid. Um, so people just think my name is Sia all the time now. <laughs> or, um, so yes. And you can find me on there and it started out as like a style Instagram, but now it's just me wearing my cute clothes and dropping truth bombs. So cute. Yes. 
Uh, you're um, so fun. Thanks. Um, I also have a podcast. It's called Plaid Skirts and Basic Black. I co-host it with my friend Shannon. You can follow us on Instagram at PSBB Podcast. The two of us have co-authored a book that's coming out in January um, through Ave Maria Press. And so um, we're, I'm, we're, we were just emailing marketing today. I'm like, oh my gosh, our pre-sale is about to happen. So like, Yay! it's kind of crazy. Like within like this, like maybe next month, within the next like seven, eight weeks, we're going to be like, hey, can someone buy our book? Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's so exciting. Yeah. I I'm really excited about it. Like I can't, I can't wait. So I've got like, those are my major projects right now. And I've got a lot of writing that I'm trying to do and, um, and sharing more thoughts uh, outside of Instagram. Yeah. You know? Okay. Well, great. Well, I'm so happy to cheer all of that on with you. Um, praying with you and for you. So, so grateful. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. It has been all my pleasure watching Valerie at PAX Beloved share her many artistic gifts with the world. She creates Catholic artwork and gifts with such love and detail. Sometimes I'll be on Instagram and will stop mid-scroll to pray with some image that she has created that has left me speechless. Her creations line my prayer closet. Please go follow her there at pax.valerie and head over to her website at paxbeloved.com. You can use the code SSS20 to get 20% off. Hi, Beefy. Hi. Okay, so do you remember that list of questions that I found um, on the internet that, I don't know, that it was like, how well do you know your best friend? Yes, yes. Okay, well, I found one that I thought was funny, and it was, um, how would your best friend be an asset if you were stuck on a deserted island? Okay. And so I have thought about this. So I'm going to go first while okay, you think. Thank you. Okay. 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 So we would have to eat really disgusting things, right? Like the only things that would be available to us would be, I don't know, like weird roots or foreign berries and rodents, like the slow ones or whatever. And I actually think people eating weird berries, um, like causes people to die. So that's the first way I'm going to be an asset because I'm not going to let us do that, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I actually did watch a movie about that once. Um, okay, so find the slow rodents. But um, you would be really good at tricking me into mm -hmm. and like hiding what we were eating because you would use like, you know, foreign spices, you would use exotic juices, you would <laughs> like decorate the banana leaf, you know, mm -hmm. in, in such a way that I would be like very well distracted about the potential poison or, mm -hmm. you know, the gross rodent. I, I, I feel like your creativity in the kitchen, your talent for cooking would sustain us. Okay. But I would not be tricked. Like my stomach is literally like turning right now. <laughs> I would know exactly what I hit or covered up. <laughs> you should get yourself one of you. <laughs> um, okay. So what would I add? Okay. This is actually not that hard. Um, you would add perspective. I'd be running around cooking, trying to make rodents taste less rodent-y, um, stressing out about how we were going to like make a plan to get back to the plans that we had at home. <laughs> and you'd say things like, I mean, we're basically movie stars on the set of Survivor right now. I mean, people <laughs> apply and audition and work really hard to have a spot here. And I mean, we just happened upon this amazing, unique experience. And I mean, this is actually better than Survivor because there's no one like recording us while we go to the bathroom. And I mean, I'm making you sound ditzy and that's not what I mean. I just mean like your perspective is always so like unique and fabulous that it's like hard for me to capture my normal voice. Um, you'd be like, I mean, we're basically receiving the gift of knowing Jesus better because mm -hmm. I mean, we're getting to be and reflect here and have an experience similar to what he would have in the wilderness. So, I mean, we are so fortunate. B. <laughs> okay. I want to punch my own self in the face. Oh, no, I love it. I you know, I feel like on like half of your social media posts, my response is always like, I like love this perspective because it's unique. So I mean that sincerely. You're the best. Okay. So what would Marcia add? Like, was she not fantastic? Oh my gosh. Fantastic. She would like hype us up and insist that we not give up and help us see things in a new way, like in our underwear for sure. That was my favorite part. Yes. So um, good. So good. So good. But I mean, in all seriousness, like it's, it's sad when we like when seeing another woman love herself fiercely is like a shocking thing. Yeah. Um, 
I, I instantly felt like freer listening because I, I think we can have these kinds of things modeled for us just like anything else. And I was grateful for her modeling. Oh, yes. That's really good. I, you know, okay. Like our minds are functional, you know, like we can right. change them. And I feel like repetition is this like huge enemy to progress because we've repeated these same hateful messages right. in our head, but we can change those messages. It's Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think that's true, but I feel like it can be even more subtle than that. Like, I don't feel like it has to be hatred. Y'all talked about that a little bit, but it can just be like a lack of appreciation. I feel like is what she's yeah. saying. And there's so many, yeah. so many things that shape the lack of appreciation, right? Like childhood experiences. Um, I was shook hearing about yours and when y'all were talking, I want to like physically harm the woman that said that to you. Um, but like images and social media, seeing very normal things is gross. Um, it's because it's a low yeah. level disrespect or disregard. It can like fly under the radar and make us think uh, that there's like no real work, work to do. And there oh, is. that's so good. Wow. I don't have anything to say to that. That is really good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I have an idea. I've thought a lot about that playground moment. Um, so can I tell you what I would say if I were there? <laughs> I would have been there. Yes. <laughs> it might make me cry a little bit. <laughs> I know, me um, too. I mean, I knew, I, I obviously I know that story. I remember that. And I don't know if it's about, it was just that moment or after hearing the rest of the interview or having an eight-year-old daughter, but I would scoop that precious little girl up from the playground and tell her that I would do anything to protect her from the broken world and the broken people in it. I'd tell her that I would be her beef until she was older than dirt. And then I would always be there to remind her the truth about herself. Mm. Um, I would also encourage her to tell someone safe about the evil things that that woman said, because, you know, Mm. hate and shame lose at least some of their power when we fight the urge to hide them and call them what they are and shine a light on them. Um, but I would tell her that God has incredible plans to use the way that people have been cruel to her. And that because of her experiences, I've always thought this about you. Um, she will grow up with the gift of being able to see people like mm. really see people in ways that other people overlook. Um, and that you she'll teach others how to really see themselves and their neighbors. Oh my gosh. That's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> so true. It's really sweet. <laughs> Um, okay. Take a second girl. Um, okay. Well, <laughs> so for me, like when I was around that same age, I was really struggling with my weight, little, little, little chubby and I was on diets too young. Um, mm. so knowing my insecurities, what would you say to me as a kid? Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Um, I, I think, uh, I think first <laughs> I would want to tell you that it gets so much better. And not just because like you're gonna have a major glow up because you have a major <laughs> you had a major glow up. Um, but also um anything that anyone um would use about your weight at that young age to make you feel afraid is not true. Like that that's that's not true. You're gonna be incredibly healthy. You are going to be very active when you feel like it. <laughs> Um, you're going to have no shortage of suitors. Like there are very (laughs) handsome, talented men that want (laughs) your attention and that you're going to have a beautiful, ridiculously, um, beautiful family. So I feel like the things that the grownups are afraid for us, it, it regarding Mm -hmm. our size or our weight or whatever, Mm -hmm. it's just not true. It's just not true. And so anything that somebody would use to like shame you into the, into the right size, it's, it's not accurate. Um, I would also want to take a young person and, and explain that the world is really screwy Mm -hmm. and we don't have like everything. We have this value system that, um, celebrates all the wrong things and that there is nothing special about being picked first in PE, nothing. Mm. There is nothing special about, you know, finishing in the first group of people across the finish line. There is so much more to life than that. And the thing is, is that the other things in life that like actually make the world go round, you nail, you (laughs) 
nail them. Like the things that actually make the world a better place, the fearlessness that you use to do your profession, um, the wisdom that you possess that make you the first person that a jillion people call when they need advice, the like the the nurture that you possess as a mom that makes you even fling your doors wide open to mother anyone mm-hmm. who might need it. Like so these nice. are the things that like you possess in such an embodied way. And the thing is, you you would have every single one of those things no matter what size you are. Every single one of those things are perfectly in place. So Ugh. good beef. I feel like we need to grab our Kleenex and head to a playground right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gosh, I know. I do kind of, I, I feel it. I don't know if I need like coffee or wine, but like I would like to share be- a beverage with you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right. Love you, beef. Love you. Be a Heart Design is committed to creating and experiencing beauty. They create products that walk us through the joys and sorrows of life. Swaddle blankets, wooden puzzles, laptop sleeves, lunch boxes, digital planners, and my very favorite paper planner that doesn't just keep my life organized, but also keeps me rooted in prayer. Everything created is designed to reflect God's goodness. Head on over to Be A Heart Design on Instagram and check out the many gifts for special occasions, the thoughtful little somethings to let someone know you're thinking of them, or head over and pick out something nice for yourself. Use code SSS15 for 15% off. Thank you, friends, for tuning in. Catch us next week. Please subscribe so that you don't miss a thing. And consider heading over to patreon.com slash Allison Sullivan to help support the show. You help us grow. And for a little fun, you can head over to Sullivan Family TikTok. Today's show was a production of Allison Sullivan in conjunction with the Forte Catholic Podcast Network. For more great Catholic podcasts, head on over to ForteCatholic.com slash podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.